So the exam is when? Thursday, and you're going to bring what? Your laptop. Everybody knows how to log in to Rowdy, whatever. You can get the Blackboard. So the file will be on Blackboard. I'll send it out right at 2.20. Well, hopefully we can start at 2.20. And so you'll load it, and then you'll resubmit it on Blackboard. Um, and I'll print out the page with the, the data. The charts will all be in the Word documents you'll load, but the data will be printed out. Um, I'll even have the definitions of ratings in there so you can copy and paste that if you need to. They won't include everything. I've kept out some of the stuff that just takes a lot longer to discuss. So it should be a, actually a little easier than your than your project. Do you re do you realize previous classes have done the entire thing in class without anything open notes? So you know there's nothing to complain about. It should be a lot easier for you, except for what's you know what's gonna be the biggest problem. You know, I don't know what it's going to be. Students that say open book and what do they do? Don't study. What's that going to do to you on Thursday? You're going to be crushed by the time. You'll have no time to get it done. So forget that it's open book. Let that just be a backup in case you forget something. But go for it as if it's a closed book exam. Otherwise, just, when the time's up, the time is up. we got to stop. There's other classes coming in and you have other classes. All right. So any questions? Y'all got it? Right, huh? I format it as one column, so you don't have to really, if you want to make it two, you can, but I would just keep it in the one just to keep, it just makes it easier. So yeah, I made it one. Yeah, formatting won't matter. Typos don't really matter. Be careful though that you don't have so many typos, I can't tell what you actually wrote. Um, that's kind of the advantage of typing. I can read your typing better than your handwriting, but do, you know, if you see a squiggly line, you know, you might right click and fix it at least at the end. I'd recommend you just go full blast through it and maybe highlight places to come back. So watch the time and then come back and fix those areas you're worried about. If you're really confused on something, then leave it blank. You know, it's one thing out of 15, so that won't hurt you other than, you know, spending. I remember on the CFA exam, it's a timed exam. Many of y'all will be taking the CFA or the CPA exams or timed exams. I remember on part two, no, part three, the very last one, I got stuck on a problem. It was supposed to be a 30 minute problem and I spent over an hour on it. It was a swap and I know swaps really well, but it was a currency swap and I hate currencies. So I wasted all this time. My answer was scratched out, did the opposite answer, struck that out, did the opposite answer, struck that out. So I kept doing that. So whoever was grading it was like, this guy doesn't have a clue. Uh, and then I spent the rest of the exam trying to catch up. So you don't want to do that. If you get stuck on something, leave it and come back. Worst case is you have one thing, one blank, but you don't lose that many points. All right. Okay. And then you have spring break. So you're going to recover. I'll, I'll grade them as fast as I can after spring break. All right. Once we get past this exam, I'm going to send out the financial applications. I haven't quite decided how I'm going to do them, but you'll focus on these once you get back from spring break. But I'm going to show you the first one in case you want to get started on. What I haven't decided is how I'm going to do it. I've had issues in the past where some students just can't resist borrowing another student's file and submitting it as their own. So I may actually send out homework problems where you all have your own unique problems, which is going to be a lot of extra workload for me to create that, but I'm actually do that. But the first one is you might want to do this, you know, right after the exam, get it out of the way. I'll give you plenty of time. So there's nothing going to be due before spring break. So, so anything I'd be due probably two weeks after spring break. So you, you're going to have some time. But this first one is the only unusual one. All the all the exam, all of these are going to be Excel applications except for this very first one. But what I want you to do is you know, in your project, you did liquidity, solvency, turnover, margin, return on capital. What I want you to do is go to this business breakdown. If you haven't done it yet, and I'm really trying to get you addicted to this. In fact, this is a good test. If you listen to the business breakdown and you find it really boring, you should probably change majors because this is what you're going to do the next 50 years of your life. This is what management majors and accounting majors and finance majors do. Unless you're an accounting major, it's going to be taxed the rest of your career. This is what you do. It's how do you understand a business? What makes it tick? How does it make money? How does it service customers? How does it market? How does it handle the supply chain? Um, all those kind of things. It's really, really good. Have any of y'all listened to this one yet? Anybody tried it? Dante, 
yeah, y'all can talk to him and see if it's really as good as I say it is. I, I find it really exceptional. The one I really liked was Cinnabon, but I have to say another one they've added since was AutoZone. And I thought AutoZone was very good as well. Uh, what I like about Cinnabon is the CEO of the company. Most of these other ones, it's an investment person talking about. They do have a few where they have the CEO. I think on the Smile Club, which was really good as well, the young old Smile Club. I think the Smile Club was the CEO, and that one was really, really good. But this is um, this is the CEO. I think her name, if I got it right, is Kat Cole. You should read her story because her story is pretty amazing. She did not, she's not a, you know, Harvard grad kind of a typical CEO of the firm. She kind of has an unusual uh, background. Um, but Georgia State University early career. Uh, she worked at a body shop before she went to Hooters. Then she went from there. I mean, it's just unusual background. Um, so a really interesting person. So I think you enjoy listening to it just because uh, she has a pretty interesting background. What I really like about it, you know, I think about when I listen to her talk and the same first, the same thing with the small club guy. When I hear them talk, there's CEOs that say, well, I could work for this company. They have a vision. They understand the business and how it works. Um, so I, I really like that one and a few others that I thought were really interesting. If you did Costco, there is a Costco one in there. It's pretty good as well. So listen to it. It's about 45 minutes. What you have to do is prove to me that you listen to the whole thing, but I also want you to find ways to link it to the class. So the one thing that you will always hear them talking about is turnover. Everybody talks about turnover. How do we get more revenue? So for Pat Coles, she's going to talk a lot about franchising. What is a franchising strategy? It's a turnover strategy. How do you get more revenue without having to build more stores? Are y'all familiar with Cinnabon? Has anyone in here ever eaten a Cinnabon? I've never done it. I'm always tempted. My idea, if my plane gets delayed, that means calories are free and I'll eat it whatever I want to. So it's a dangerous time, but I've never given in the Cinnabon. Um, pretty interesting story, but it's a very franchise story. And it's interesting. She talks about the franchisers. Um, the franchisers say, hey, you're starting a license. The license is another thing. So with turnover, really focus of hers is this ideal franchise and then licensing. She really understands the business. So licensing is she'll do something like with Burger King. We'll see how Burger King's selling Cinnabons. Well, now the franchise are saying, well, what about us? You know, are we not important to you anymore? And her answer to that, that was really in insightful. She said, you are our franchise. When people, you are our brand name. When people go to the airport and they smell Cinnabon, that's what they think of. That's the reason they go to Burger King. Without you, we don't exist. And so she made a point of keeping the franchises. And what happened to the franchises the last three, weeks, three years? Have they been doing well? Where, where are most of her franchises? Airports, right? So it's been a pretty horrible, horrible experience. And she had to keep them going. And she talks about that. How did she keep them going? Keep them, we got without going to businesses. We took advantage of that to modernize some of these facilities, get them up to date. So when people come back to the airport, they'll be ready to go. So really insightful. They'll also talk about margin. A licensing business is a very high margin business. And she'll talk about that as well. She probably won't talk about liquidity and solvency. So these are the two you probably won't hear them talking about with one exception. Are you remember on liquidity, there's a close tie to turnover. So the auto zone one I thought was really interesting. We may have talked about it earlier, but just to remind you, he was talking about how auto zone, part of their brand is that when you go there, they'll have it in stock. What does that mean? Their inventories are gonna be really high, which means inventory turnover is gonna be terrible. And yet he says, yeah, our inventory turnover is really bad, but we have negative capital, working capital. Their working capital assets are less than their working capital liabilities, even though they have all the inventory. How do they do that? He explains that pretty interesting stuff. Um, 
So you just got to pick one. Cinnabon's the one I like, but any of these others would be good. The Smile Club was great. Uh, there's several of them out there. So um, the New York Times, I haven't listened to that one yet. Basic Fit. Um, that one was interesting because I'm not familiar with them. They also did, uh, who's the uh, workout bike people? Yeah, yeah, Peloton, they did them. It didn't get me to buy their stock because I wasn't quite convinced on the story, but it was an interesting one. They did UPS. UPS was extremely interesting. UPS has a new CEO, and that one was another story where I was like, man, I want to buy it, invest in this company just because of the CEO. So he went out of retirement. I'm not to say that she's old, but she went out of retirement and came back in to, to run CPS, UPS because they're having problems and she radically is changing that company. Um, you know, if I were you, boy, I would, the Smile Club, UPS, Cinnabon, just pick a company whose CEO get excited when they talk about the business, something you brag about because you work for that business. I don't know if I'd brag about working for UPS, but she's taken a pretty old stodgy company with a lot of problems. So she's actually, and what, one of the things she talks about with margin is, hey, let Amazon have it. Small packages, these $20 deliveries, they can have it. That's not our business. We're gonna focus on the right things. So turnover and margin is what she talks a lot about, about a lot in her, she's not actually in on that one. There's another investment guy talking about it, but really, really interesting. Um, Exxon, there's a company that's really struggling. Facebook, that Facebook one would be interesting because this was before the stock price fell 30%. Might be interesting what they say about that. Invisalign, they did both Invisalign and Smile Club. I don't, I, I think I was the first Invisalign person in San Antonio. Um, I went to my dentist, got my trumpet player and one of my teeth was pushing forward because I don't play as much as anymore. I say, what I do, I can't get braces because then I can't play. He leaves his office, comes back and throws the pamphlet at me. Says, no one's done this before, but you want to try it? I said, yes, sure, why not? So I know Invisalign from our product, but Smile Club is very, they're very, very different companies. They do very different things, very different price points, very different customer bases. Like how many of them are going after the dental offices versus, you know, direct to the consumer. Very interesting. Petco is in there, Shopify, Twilio, some of these firms I had not familiar with until I listened to the, uh, the business breakdown. They do a great job, but what you're doing is proving to me that you listen to it. And then as you go through it, make the link. You don't have to quote them directly, but you know, she talked about this and you can in generic terms talk about it. Uh, and I'll, I'll put up the link on Blackboard just to make sure you're, you're submitting. This is the one where the grades will probably range a lot more than the other ones. On the Excel, if you do it right, it's 100% it's a piece of cake. But on this one, um, I'm gonna look at effort. If you send me three sentences, you know, a quarter of a page, that's probably not gonna give you many points. If you send me 40 pages, that was overkill. It's not a paper. So enough to show that you listen to it, but really be listening in on those things we talked about in class. Make those connections that you're starting to understand businesses more and more and more as you go through your college career, how they run, how they operate. Really fascinating stuff. And then after you do project, this first application, keep listening to business breakdowns, especially if you're interviewing with one of these firms, well, I would absolutely be listening to that. Or if you're interviewing with HEB, well, I'd go listen to the Costco one. That would be pretty critical to understand that business. You know, if you're gonna interview with a, you know, FedEx, go listen to the UPS one. Get yourself associated with how they talk about these businesses. Um, she uses, uh, oh, I can't remember the, the acronym. It's not CCP, CPP, but consumer packaged products. She uses, but she never says that term. But she kept using that over and over again, whatever it was, consumer packaged products. Why would she just use the acronym? Because once you get into that business, you forget that they're acronyms. You forget that they're jargon. You just use that jargon. There's a few of them to use that jargon. You'll have to look at the jargon and see. But if you're interviewing for a firm like that, it'd be kind of nice to know that jargon that you could bring it into an interview and use those terms. Um, so why does she say that? Well, because they're talking about put a Cinnabon 
into the uh, grocery store. That's consumer packaged product. So they did a, a relationship, I think, with General Mills. I can't remember. Uh, where they, rather than General Mills producing a, a, a cinnamon, they did Cinnabon so they could use their name. Uh, that's a very different market. When you're packaging something, put it in a store, that's a very different market than someone buying it hot out of the oven and consuming it. You've got a lot of issues there. Will the consumer like it as much? Will it really be the same product? Will it make as much sense? So she, she goes through quite a bit of stuff in 45 minutes. I mean, I think most of them are about 45 minutes long. Um, yeah, right, right at 45 minutes. Some of them a little longer. Viacom, that one was... That one was interesting too. There's the Peloton one. Uh, cannabis, I haven't listened to that one yet. London Stock Exchange, man, there's just a bunch of them that cover a lot of different industries. I haven't, I have not heard one yet that was not interesting. They've all been very insightful, very interesting. They do a great job. They have two or three different interviewers that do these and they all have a little bit different style, but they're really, really good. I don't know if they have a, um, if they have a kind of the text of the call, I don't see that. So, so you'll have to you'll have to type fast. So what I'd recommend is as you're going through it, if you hear something really interesting, just hit pause and type up some notes on the top of your head. Don't try to get a direct quote. Um, so if you want to do an, any other firm, that's fine. Try to find I say five to ten linkages linkages. Um, so their strategy utilizes home delivery services like DoorDash. So that's an interesting one. Restaurants are doing DoorDash. You certainly held up here that with the Chipotle one. The Chipotle one was very interesting as well. Um, well, that that might increase their turnover, but what is it going to do to their margins? It's going to be devastating to their margins if they got to pay DoorDash a, a kick kickback on part of this business. They got to deal with those two things. Got great turnover, horrible margins. How do you handle that? Chipotle had an interesting thing where um, how they actually prepare their food using these central restaurants and distributing it out, and then trying to manage that in a way that increases turnover, reduces market, reduces cost of goods sold. Uh, so try to find those linkages and prove to me that you, you you got something out of your first project that it wasn't just an academic exercise. All right. So I won't get this out to you yet, but y'all see what it is. Did y'all all get the link? Or you want to take a picture of the link? It'll be on the video for the class as well. I know you're not going to worry about it after the exam. But, uh, well, theirs is public and private. So it's whatever's on their website. It's open. Anything in there is fine. Some of them may not work as well as others. Some of them are more like the cannabis one. If it's not a specific company, that one doesn't work well. So try to look for a name of a company so you're talking about a company. They do a couple of them on like cryptocurrencies or cannabis, those kind of things. I mean, those are interesting topics, but they're not talking about a company. So. All right, that makes sense. I will promise you, you listen to Business Breakdown, you will do far better on your interviews, All right? If you find out that's not true, then you know, call me in five years and let me know. I wasted your time, but I, I can't imagine uh, you won't find this valuable. Maybe your cybersecurity, but you cybersecurity people better figure out how your business makes money and how you fit in that on the other side because everybody needs to be rowing in the same direction. All right. The other ones I'll prepare. Some of them we've already seen. We've already kind of worked through, so you'll see how they work. You can have one on time value money. Remember, we did that. Uh, a couple of classes ago, you got that video, plus you're gonna have some extra videos. My videos will work through usually the first one or two problems, and then you gotta work the other five on your own. So you work one or two, you, got, you turn those in, you watch the video and you work them, and then you use what you created for the videos to work the other problems. The next one is a cost benefit analysis one. Oh, not mine, uh, they're gonna be in a different order, so. Um, Cost benefit analysis, and you'll you'll see those. I'll work the first one. You got to work the next two. The next one should look really familiar. It's about converting bank bill pay payments from checks to electronic. Does that sound familiar? The exact same problem, and you'll have a video help with people that. So that's how they all work. 
the nice thing about them with the exception of this number six is every one of these problems on exam two, you'll get problems exactly like that. So as you're doing the Excel applications, you're also getting ready for the exams and you're getting your Excel skills up to speed um, and you're building something. I've had several students that they build something that they keep using even after the class because they found it kind of, kind of useful. The stock valuation one it can be really helpful. So they'll be in a different order because we're going in a slightly different order than I have in prior semesters, but you'll see. So we'll cover you know, how to value a bond, net present value, time value money, we'll cover everything. All right, so don't worry about any of those except for unless you want to start the first one after the exam. All right. So let's, let's talk about capital budgeting. So we got into just the actual calculations, net present value, discounted payback, and internal rate return. You're going to be doing that quite a bit, and then you'll be doing it for your project itself. So let's talk about the process, the typical process of so the first step in the process is ideas. How do you find an idea that you're going to actually spend time on doing that present day? Every firm has different ways of doing this. It might just be part of your, your job description. I had a job where that was my responsibility. So I had to stop and think, you know, what could we do that be more efficient, save time, save money? Um, so sometimes it's just your responsibility to think of things. Um, this is one of the reasons, you know, I'm not trying to encourage anyone to change majors, but I started off an accounting major. I enjoyed it, got into it, really enjoyed, you know, the monthly process. It's a little redundant for me because I kind of was doing the same thing over and over again. But I enjoyed it, but I remember the first presentation I made. Uh, my boss was sick, so I had it present for her. And I remember I, I go, you know, our annuity sales are up because we sold more annuities. That was essentially what I said. And the CEO was like, wow, that's really insightful. Why did we sell more annuities? I don't know. I'm the accountant. What I know um, is like, you know, what am I actually doing here? What's, so it kind of got frustrating me. Then I went into finance and suddenly I could do a project that saves the company 500,000 bucks and I can go to my boss and say, hey, you're not paying me near enough buff. You since you got me for free this year because I did my job and he's like, yeah, but anyone else doing your job would have done the same thing. So, you know, you, know, you have this debate where you, you can actually prove you worked at the firm. It's not that accountants don't prove your worth because they got to do that. It's response. You have to do it. But I just liked a job where I could say, hey, Here's what I did, saved the company money. And my boss is like, okay, now, now what are you going to do next? But it's kind of exciting to do that. Uh, other firms, they have outside people. Have y'all heard of Six Sigma? I think that's still used out there. Six Sigma, you have a team that's going to come in and say, hey, we're going to make your operation far more valuable. USA had a Six Sigma guy. I remember that guy. I don't know how much coffee he drank, but that was one high octane hyper person. I could not go to meetings with, I'm a pretty hyper person, but boy, he was bouncing off the walls. Kind of made me excited because he loved his job. He was out there, I'm going to, I'm going to rule the world here pretty soon. He was, he was going to change everything. Pretty exciting. Um, that I go out and search for those opportunities. Someone independent, some outside observer, um, could be from finance, someone to find those ideas. Um, you're trying to have outsiders because you're worried about biases. There are bosses out there that think their worth is how many employees work for them. So the worst thing you could do is say, hey, we can do this for fewer people. And they get kind of upset about that. So some people don't like efficiency, but then you're the outsider. My approach at USAA was let us work hand in hand finance and departments. So what my proposal was, I'll go to these departments and say, I'll do, I'll do all the Excel work for you. I'll do your entire cost benefit analysis. You don't have to worry about that, all that work. Just let me sit in on the meetings so that you have an outsider commenting. And when, once they heard I was gonna do all the Excel for them, they didn't mind having an outsider you know, listening in and, and critiquing, they were all for it. So I thought that was, that was a good approach. The finance people didn't like it, they shut that down, but I thought it was a good idea. Um, so, 
some way to bring ideas. USA had these uh, contests where if you submit an idea, you get a, a gift card to the company store. Those things tend to get you a lot of really bad ideas because people just want the gift card. So that may not work so well, but you got to find some way. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to argue that this is what separates the great companies from the bad companies. The great companies is when the entire employee base is, how can we do this better? That's why I got excited listening to the AutoZone and the Smile Club and Pat Cole and the UPS. You got CEOs that say, we can do this better. Let's get together and let's figure this out. The AutoZone person, their culture is, we're going to be Olympic quality on every single part of our value chain. There's no place where we're going to be average. That's a pretty tall order. How do you get every employee in the company to say, hey, our accounting department is going to be better than anybody else's accounting department. Our tax department is going to be better than anybody else's. Our cybersecurity department is going to crush the competition. How in the world do you get a company that's thinking like that where you have a great CEO right, as a vision that can, every employee is thinking about how can we do that better? That's pretty impressive. Once you have those ideas, that's where you're going to do the analysis. And this is really, really comes into forecasting. We'll talk more about forecasting after the after the break, but this is where you have to estimate, and this is going to be your big challenge on your project. So if you're doing a franchise, you're probably going to go out to the franchise and see what numbers they say you're going to see, and then I recommend you go to YouTube. Oh, sorry, it's probably my car will. All right. So if you do a franchise, you go to the franchise, but the franchise is probably not very reliable. It's probably too optimistic. Have any of y'all decided to do a franchise? I know a couple of you are talking about it. I don't think there's been a single team that's decided what to do, but hopefully after the exam, you'll get focused on that. Um, so franchises are easier to forecast because you can get all kinds of information on the internet, but it's biased information. So I would then go to YouTube and find those disclaimers, those people who say, wow, this franchise didn't work nearly as well as I thought it was or what the company told me it was going to be. So if you do a McDonald's franchise, McDonald's will provide you all kinds of forecasts. Then you go on YouTube and you find those McDonald's franchisers that are just like, no, it's not working at all. This is... We're not getting those numbers. I'm having to hire more people than I thought. I don't have as many customers as they thought I was going to. You know, those are the kind of things you have to look at. Um, so you got to do some forecasting. We'll talk more about that. Um, so you want to do this really, really early. So you can start working those difficult things to quantify as soon as possible. That's why I say you need to pick your project as soon as possible. So you can start doing the legwork on some of these projects. Uh, assumptions and the other thing you want to do is if it's a bad project you can shut it down as early as possible so you don't waste resources on a project that makes no sense whatsoever so you're going to think in terms of benefits and costs and i recommend in your excel you think about it like that what are the benefits what are the costs make it really clear and how you set it up you saw how we did that in the tech clearing example um, Make sure you have a baseline. We talked about that. So if, if the project is gonna do something to error rates or to acceptance rates, or it's gonna improve Netflix's uh, cancel rate, you wanna know what that is now so you can see if the project actually has that impact. You can't always rely on this. If you say, if we do this project, our sales are gonna go up 5% and you're doing the project in December of 2019, and in 2020, your sales actually dropped 60%. Does that mean your forecast was bad? What does that mean? You didn't know we were having a pandemic. It was going to shut the whole world down. You can't do much about that. But as you want to try as best as you can to try to get that as accurate as you can. Um, if it involves a contract, this is one of my pet peeves at USA. I'd be working with a, con with a project and... I'd say, you know, this project's really not making much sense. And they say, well, it's too late. We've already signed the contract. I think, well, why did you do the cost benefit analysis if you already decided you're going to do the project? And they were doing the cost benefit just perfunctory. We got to do it. It's one of those check boxes. Like, no, you 
do the cost benefit analysis and see if you want to do the project. What I found really valuable to me was to do the cost benefit analysis and then use that to bring the vendor's price down. That was really, really helpful. I could tell the vendor, hey, what you're charging us gives us a negative net present value. You better come down to your price or there's no way this project can be approved. That was really, really valuable. I had one vendor. Um, we were going to outsource some option trading to them because I really didn't want to hire an option trader. Uh, it was Credit Suisse. I guess I can say that on the video. So Credit Suisse, they come with a proposal and I call them up and say, hey, if I don't hire you, I'm going to hire someone internally and I'm not going to pay them even half what you're charging me. You can see what they're thinking now. It's okay. His cost benefit is he can hire us or he can do it himself. He's willing to pay more to hire us because they have to build the infrastructure and the legal side and all that, but he's not going to pay us twice as much. So they very quickly figured out what my baseline was before I signed the contract. I told them, yeah, you know, if, if you're too expensive, I'll just do it myself. I didn't have to give them the numbers. They could figure out how much it would cost me to hire an option trader in San Antonio. But guess what their next bid was? <laughs> Slightly more expensive than what it would cost me to hire someone. So it works really well. So I use cost benefit analysis as a negotiating tool. Works really, really well. Gets you off, you know, if you're not a negotiator, I'm not a negotiator. I don't like negotiating, but it takes a lot of that stress out. It's like, hey, cost benefit analysis says you're charging too much. Not much I can do about it. Either come down on your price or we're just not going to do this project. It gives you something really concrete to work. I wouldn't lie to them. You know, if your net present value is positive 3 million, don't tell them it's negative. You know, I would be honest with them, but you don't have to give them your numbers. Um, but, you know, certainly if it's too much and you can't certainly support the project with that price, you can certainly get them to come down. And here's something you need to be thinking all along. This is probably the lowest score on every project is students spend so little time thinking the intangibles. And intangibles, anything you, you can't put a dollar to, but is valuable. It can be customer service. It can be employee morale. Um, it can be negative things. It can be the impact on the environment all kinds of things. You're going to buy a Tesla to do an EV. You can certainly bring in the intangibles related to the environmental impact. Um, but think through the intangibles. If you're doing a franchise, like I was talking about the Subway franchise, don't tell me a Subway franchise is going to make me $60,000. It's not worth it. It's not worth my time, the stress. No, just owning a franchise is not a fun thing. Do you think? Do you agree with me? It's a pain, isn't it? Stuff is going to go wrong at the worst possible time. You're going to be traveling. So everything's going to blow up. You're going to cancel your vacation. Your family's going to be mad at you. You know, there's this, this. Those are intangibles that are hard to value, but you want to put those in there. There are intangible benefits and intangible costs. And benefits can be, um, I don't know, I think of the word, but affinity type of things. So, like owning a, an, owning a Tesla is going to really make me look cool to my friends. It would be fine. I was telling Dante I don't have one because it would make me look like I'm going through a midlife crisis. So that's why I don't have a Tesla. Um, but, you know, my Prius doesn't look like a midlife crisis. So it looks pretty, pretty normal for a 59-year-old man. Uh, but those kind of things you can add into that as, as well. A franchise is all that extra time you got to put into um, – so yeah, think think through the incremental benefits and costs. And a good example is a corporate jet. So for USAA, a corporate jet, it saves you paying for all that commercial airfare. It saves employees time. That's nice because I mean it's really nice. I drive up to the hangar at USAA like 20 minutes before the flight leaves. I park right at the door, walk in, get on the plane, and leave. Does that sound like a commercial airline? much nicer right really nice seats they service shrimp and cocktails and all this kind of stuff not alcohol but kind of really nice nice food um we get to the airport there's a van that picks us up right at the plane we actually literally walk off the plane into that that saves us a lot of time but the family life balance that i can do a trip in one day that would normally take me two or three days i don't have to stay in a hotel that's a huge intangible benefit um, that i'm sure glad I didn't have to go through all that, that commercial flight. Um, now, 
if you have an intangible benefit or cost, see if you can make it a tangible. So what if one of your intangible costs is the time it's going to take you? You got to spend all this extra time. So like for me, I have a Prius Prime. It takes me a little extra time to plug it in because I don't have a garage. So it probably costs me an extra three minutes a day on average because I have a Prius Prime. In a month, that's probably 25 minutes because I don't charge it every day. It doesn't take me 25 minutes a month with gas in my car. Maybe that's 10 minutes. So it's an extra 15 minutes a month because I have a Prius instead of a gas car. That's 15 minutes of my time. How much was my time worth? Well, if someone were to give you an hour of time, we're going to make a day 25 hours long instead of 24. You're not going to lose any sleep. You're not going to get tired. It's like a free hour of time. How much would you pay for that? That'd be worth 20 bucks, 40 bucks, 50 bucks. What would you pay? You have to think. You have to think through that as far as maybe you can put that in. I had one project. Um, uh, one of my students was doing the cost benefit analysis of his wife getting a PhD. And she, he had to figure out her time. How much was her time worth? Um, and he, he came up with a number. I don't know if he told her the number, <laughs> but he came up with a number for her time. And it wasn't just her time. It was her time related to him as well because um, he was going to take over a lot of stuff. Uh, you know, he's going to be 80% of the household chores instead of 50. That's a lot of his time as well. So he actually sat down and he put that into his model. Now, what I recommend, and you'll see this when, when we talk to your groups, is if you have an intangible benefit or cost that's material to your project, I actually recommend you do the project with and without it. So I had one team that was uh, related to uh, carbon, um, global warming. Uh, I can't remember if it was solar panels or what, but they actually calculated the impact on the environment using government numbers. And they were huge. They actually made the project go positive. So what they did, they did the project with and without that. Because the lady that came up with those numbers, she was an environmental scientist. And she said, yeah, we use the government numbers before they exaggerate. <laughs> There's no way we're really adding that much value to the environment, but they're the numbers we have. So we're going to put that in there. So they did it with and without, and they got two radically different cancers. So if you're doing a solar panel, you can actually figure out how much less carbon are we putting into the air, and you can go to the government agency and see how much that's actually worth in dollars, and you can add that. I had one guy go a little overboard. His project is, what if I buy a fancy bike and ride that to work instead of driving my car? And he actually calculated his carbon, and in that he included the fact that he would be breathing more heavily and be expelling more. I mean, that was to me a little overkill, but he went out 47 decimal places to get his intangible benefits and costs. Right, but very important to your project, it's a big part of the grade. The, the discount rate for your project, that's just gonna be whatever your cost of capital is for your firm, or just use 5% for your project, and then you stick it all into the model that you're gonna build. So we're gonna work with that. Uh, your project, you will have to show me your, your Excel before you present it. So, all right, you may know what that is. Is that my phone again? All right. This is this is essentially your project, right? All right. So you're going to spend. We're going to get really, really intensely into it after the uh, after the uh, break. All right. Yeah, I'll, I'll just talk over that so we can keep going. Sorry. You're also required to do sensitivity analysis. What if you're wrong? What if one of your key assumptions is wrong? If you're doing a franchise, it's almost always going to be your revenue, your number of customers. That's your biggest unknown. You might say maybe number of employees, but what's going to drive number of employees? Your number of customers. That's probably pretty predictable. You might change the number of employees depending on your different scenarios. My revenue is this, I'll have three employees. If my revenue is this, I'll have four. If it's this, I only need two. So that's pretty easy to adjust. So your unknown is the revenues. It's not the number of employees. You just adjust that automatically. Um, if you're doing a Tesla, it might be number of miles that you drive. It might be gasoline prices. Right now, Tesla looks really great. My Prius looks really great right now. It's probably saving me $100 a month. But for the first two years I had it with COVID, wasn't saving me hardly anything because I wasn't 
wasn't driving all that much. So you have to figure out what those best case and worst case are. Gas prices are pretty high right now. Are you gonna assume $4 gas prices the next five years if you're going to Tesla? Are you gonna assume gas prices come down? What's gonna be your base case? What would you say, base case for gasoline prices? If, if I'll pay you a million dollars, if you can get plus or minus gas prices in five years, what would you, what would you pay? I'm not gonna do it, but it'd be a million bucks, plus or minus 10%, what would you guess? More than four? How many would say more than four? In five years. 375? Anybody think less than two bucks? Electric cars are going to take over the world, right? What do you think this year is going to do to EV sales? Are you hearing anybody saying, I, I got to get rid of this F, F-150 pickup truck? What kind of cars? Commuter cars. What's a commuter? Oh, just for getting to work. Yeah. Yeah, I got now people that do Uber for that. You know, it's their second car. Uber is their second car, which could be a project. Um, so, yeah, you, um, you've got to make a decision. It's got to be what, what I'm grading on on your team is your rationale behind it and the data behind it. You have some support for that. Sorry. Is it just our room or is it out in the hall? Yeah. All right. Well, we'll test your ability to ignore extraneous noises. Just pretend like you know, this is your boss and your boss doesn't know what they're talking about. Just kind of pretend. You got to be careful when you do that, though. Once I was with my boss, it's like, ugh, when he was walking down the with his phone, I was like, oh, hey, boss. So don't, don't react too badly. Um, so sensitive analysis is a big part of your project. What I rate is that you pick the right thing and I can definitely help you on this. We'll, we'll get into that. You wanna be thinking about that early on because when you pick your assumptions, you also gotta pick which assumption are you gonna vary and how do you get that range? The way I think about it is the 90% or really the 80%. So 80% of the time, your assumptions should be between these two points. That's what you're trying to do, best case, worst case. I will tell you, if you're doing a franchise or almost any project, if your worst case is we make a lot of money, I just don't believe it. I don't believe there are projects out there where your worst case is you make a fortune. If that were true, what would you be doing? You would be doing that project, wouldn't you? If you really believe it. I'm gonna open a smoothie case, worst case, I'll make 2 million bucks. I think I'll make 4 million. Best case, I'll make 10 million. Well, why are you in school? Go open a sweetie. It's pretty obvious. So I don't believe that. There's worst case scenarios that are going to be losing money. Most worst case scenarios should be negative net present value. If they're not, your range is too wide. And we know in forecasting, we're far too optimistic, which is good. It's nice that we're optimistic. But forecasting, you got to really think the downside. If the project's significantly positive, um, do the break even. So you're going to require to do the, the, the break even. Why would this project have to be such that it just barely makes sense? So one project I had at USA, this is back when IBM sold PCs. So the project is, do we buy the PCs or do we lease them from IBM? And the big unknown is what we could resell those PCs for. This is back when you could resell a PC for a thousand, two thousand bucks. Today you throw them in the dumpster, but back then you could resell them. And I could have gone to IT and said, what are you going to resell these PCs for in three years? But I didn't do that. Instead, I calculated the break even. And I said, okay, the break even is $1,200. If you can sell these PCs for more than $1,200, we should buy them. If not, we should lease from IBM. And the IT people said, there's no way we can sell those PCs for $1,200. bucks. we will be lucky to get $500. So, okay, project done. We'll lease from IBM. Why was IBM getting such a good deal? because IBM didn't want us dumping a bunch of PCs on the market, use PCs on the market. So they had an incentive to give us a really good deal and they did. But you see how my, me doing the break even made the job of IT go much easier. They didn't have to come up with a price. They just had to tell me higher or lower. So it's, it was a good technique. You'll be doing goal seek. 
You won't be using Solver. I doubt Solver will work here, but you should learn how to use Solver definitely if you haven't yet. But goal seek is how you find out that break even. You saw that on the example project. Um, if you have a firm that does cost benefit and they don't seek sensitivity analysis, you need to really beg them to do it. I think it's extremely, extremely important to do cost benefit analysis with sensitivity analysis. And the reason I say that is most base cases are far, far too optimistic. Don't make sense. And it's because there's too much bias in the process. The person pushing the project wants it approved. They don't want it assessed, they want it approved. Just do it. Go get a CBA that has a positive net present value. And that gives you really bad assumptions. And that's why I wanted finance involved in this. In this. Say, so why in the world are you assuming that? That doesn't make sense. Where did you get that number? Is that pushback? Make sure you have reasonable numbers because if you're approving projects that make no sense, you're destroying the value of the firm and you want to fight against that. You want to work for your firm just like Cinnabon where everybody's just working together to create something great. You don't want those biases that destroy companies. Then you got to make a decision. You're actually going to have a decision at the end where you're going to say, we recommend you do this project or not. I'm going to be looking at your project presentations as if I'm the CFO, whatever of this. And I, have, I have to make a decision. And did you give me enough information for me to make a high quality decision? How confident do I feel at the end? You're going to be asked to remember at the end, you're going to make your presentations over Zoom or whatever. You as fellow peers are going to have to watch at least one other project and do an assessment. So I want you to make the same assessment. Did they do a good job of really doing all the analysis? By the time you do your presentation, I'm going to have seen it so much. I'm going to, have, I'm going to already know everything. So, you know, you're already going to tell me essentially what you're going to propose. But I'm going to try to watch it as if it's the first time I'm watching that. So does it have a positive net present value? Does it have a payback that's within some reasonable bounds? Not that you're going to have a standard, but that your payback makes sense. Um, what's the internal rate of return? So you're going to present those. If it doesn't have a net present value that's positive, but you still think the project makes sense, what's that intangible benefit that makes it make sense? So you might say, hey, you know what? The project net present value is negative, but boy, the impact on employer morale is gonna be huge. We couldn't really measure that productivity gain, but our employees complain about this all the time. We just gotta get this done. Yeah, it's got a negative 10,000 net present value. We can't figure out a way to make it positive, but let's just do it. It's the cost of doing business. Um, and the intangible is probably worth much more than 10,000 because we're losing really good employees. Yeah, I mean, that's, that can be a convincing case. So don't assume just because your net present value is negative that you can't say this project needs to be approved. There are projects that make sense entirely based on intangible benefits. And there are projects that you refuse because of the intangible cost, even though it has a positive net present value. It was like that tax example I gave you at USA, high net present value, value but ridiculous headline risk. We didn't even take it to the CEO because the headline risk was just, was just terrible. The next thing you do is ask about the sensitivity analysis. Is there anything there that makes you really, really nervous about this project? That it's just, boy, if, if we're right, we make 10,000. If we're wrong, we lose 10 million. Yeah, let's, it's a 5% chance this is a disaster. Let's not, let's not do it. And then how confident are you on your, your assumptions? Now, you're not going to actually do this, have it signed off by some expert in the firm, but how confident are these assumptions? So if USA, if I'm doing an IT project, I better have some systems person signing off on the project. Um, I, was re I was involved in developing products at USA. You don't develop a product at USA without an actuary involved. So, you know, I, uh, my only patent I've ever done was an annuity product, and it's a horrible product. I'll even say that for the video. Terrible product, but the CEO said develop this project. So we developed it. I got the actuaries together. We put it together, set a record and how fast we developed it because he wanted it. Um, but the actuaries had to sign off on it because I'm not an actuary. It was an actual product. Um, so you have to do that. And what I highly recommend is that you go to those people as early as possible. So this is a warning to you finance people. If you need an assumption from the accountants, you go to them early. Like for the tax department, 
my good friend Amy, she was the head of the tax tax department. USA has how many ever need tax accountants in here? Anybody want to be a tax accountant? Patrick, you need to go to USA. They have one of the best tax departments around. I'm sure it's still that way. When I was there, just wonderful people. But I knew Amy really well. She's the head of the department. I knew if I had a project that had tax implications, I would go for early on. She would give it to one of her analysts, and they would do a great review analysis. I'm really impressed by the analysis they did. I do it early on. If you don't do it early on, you're about to go get your project approved, and now you're going to go check with the tax department. They're like, hey, we don't have time for this. And then you present it, and they turn over to Amy and say, okay, Amy, are you okay with this? It's, you know, I, I just saw this yesterday. The tax pieces are pretty material. I, I can't I can't approve this project. You, you know, you're in trouble. So go early. Get them on your side. Uh, Amy and I, we kind of both kind of needed each other's departments, so we kind of helped each other out. So a great relationship um, on that. So, you know, build your – you build your network, get these people on your side. Don't come to them in the last second and ask for their, their help because it's just not fair to them. And we did some pretty complicated projects. Um, we did some that the tax implications, one guy, he brought me a 16 page paper. I wanted to do options in our pension plan. I wanted to do options on the PNC portfolio. The tax implications were horrendous. And the two of us sat down, he went through so impressive. He went through every scenario, told me the tax implications for this and this, how we get around the, the, the wash rules, which he really said we couldn't. Um, he probably spent a good 20, 30 hours on that project. So go to those people and ask them early on. So what I learned to do very early on is when I first started talking about the project, I would go talk to Amy and say, I'm going to do this project. And I'm a CPA, so I had some general idea of the tax implications. Kind of knew the tax, my corporate tax uh, class was really, really good. So I went there and said, here's what I think the tax implications are, but I need someone in your department to help me with it. And she'll say, well, how much time do I have? If I say, well, I'm presenting tomorrow, I got a very different reaction than I'm presenting in a month from now. Uh, so you need the experts um, to give you the assumptions. If you can say yes to all this, your assumptions make sense, the present value is positive, the intangibles make sense, the risk analysis makes sense, uh, then Im implement the project. You got approval, go forward. Then you have an implementation. This is when you figure out all the things you did wrong, all the costs that you thought were 10,000 or actually 20,000 and all those kind of things, or you thought you're gonna need two employees and now suddenly you have four employees. That's when all that comes to light. Sometimes it happens early enough that you can just cancel the project and shut it down. There's something real important in finance that you always wanna keep in, Time in, in mind is option value. In finance, we talk about the value of options. And if you're a finance major, you might take an option value, option pricing class. So in finance, we say we love options. What options means is if a choice between A and B, that's much more valuable than only have a choice of A. If you have a choice between A and B, that option has a value. So if you have a project, you think about it from a decision tree standpoint, y'all know decision trees, right? So either A or B happens, and then A, either A or B can happen. You have a project where if you get to a decision mode, you have an option of going this way or this way. So you may have a project where maybe it's, um, maybe it's exploration for oil. So you're gonna spend a million dollars to do exploration, if you get a report that says this, you're gonna go, you're gonna spend another five million because there's a good chance there's oils there. If not, you'll just shut it down and all you lose is a million dollars. That's much more valuable than a project where you have to spend six million dollars up front. So that optionality is incredibly valuable. So if you have a project that while you're implementing it, you have the opportunity to shut it down before you waste a lot of money, that is incredibly valuable in finance. So the more you can do that uh, and figure that out, some projects don't have that because there's a contract, you gotta spend all this millions of dollars up front. We had one project at USA, it was a marketing information system, 40 million bucks. They either can buy it or not buy it. We had to figure out if USA could get $40 million of value out of that. 
I don't like that kind of project. Because once you spend the 40 million bucks, you're stuck with this project and that's when you find out. Um, so optionality projects work really well. Um, pharmaceutical energy companies, they have a lot of projects like that where they have points where they can just shut it down and get out and move on. If you have a project like that, far more valuable. And then the last thing most firms don't do is a post project review. First thing you want to do is just see that the project achieved what we said it was going to achieve. Pretty easy with a franchise. I thought our revenues were going to be 700,000. They're actually 420,000. Whoops. <laughs> Didn't quite get what we thought. Some of them pretty obvious. Some of them are not so obvious. Find those people who sign off on assumptions and try to explain the variances. If it's that, you know, our revenues were only 420,000, but then we had a COVID and we had to shut down, that might be a good explanation that maybe they weren't bad assumptions. Um, or it could be the exact opposite. The Bill Miller, where I ride my bike, I think COVID was the best thing that's ever happened to their business. That they had like 20 cars in their drive through every single day. Pretty amazing. Well, that might mean, wow, our assumptions are really good, but are we going to be able to maintain that in the future years? Maybe that's just a one time thing. So those kind of things you're looking at, maybe don't reward the guy for the, the assumptions because maybe someone was luck. And what you're trying to do is get accountability into the process. There are people that are bad forecasters and there are people that are good folk forecasters. Uh, there's a book I highly recommend. Maybe I can find it. I'm not sure. I can't remember the name of it. I'll find it and show it to you. There it is, Super Forecasting. This is a great book. What they do in this book is they have, you know, you'll probably see some of these forecasting markets. You can bet on certain things. These kind of binomial markets are pretty interesting, really, really interesting. And there's people who actually compete in these markets and they now know who the good forecasters are and who the bad forecasters are. They got plenty of data. There are people who are consistently very good forecast. I mean, they're right. You know, the question of will Putin attack Ukraine, that was probably out there as one of those markets three weeks ago. It doesn't the fact that they say no doesn't mean they're bad forecasters. It just means on average, they're, they're much better than the average person. What this book does, which I think is so critical for accounting and finance majors, is they don't just say, here's the good forecasters and bad forecasters. They say, these are the characteristics of the good forecasters. These are the characteristics of the bad forecasters. What do good forecasters do that bad forecasters don't? So pretty important book if you're a finance person and you're gonna spend most of your life forecasting. Um, so who are those who are consistently accurate in their forecasts? Uh, in fact, these books actually say if companies would create a, a forecasting uh, kind of um, Las Vegas inside the company, they would actually get better forecasts. If you offered your employees money based on their forecasts, you would get much better forecasts. I don't know if a firm would actually go for that, but if, you, if you're Exxon and you need to forecast full prices, you'll get a better forecast. If you have a, a, a gambling uh, forecasting tool in your company, then if you just ask your oil expert what the answer is. Um, there are conflicts of interest, so you do need to try to watch for those with the bad forecast. Um, watch that with your own team. Watch that with a team member who's like, sometimes what happens, you know, discover this in undergraduate quite a bit, is you got a team that's looking at a project and suddenly everybody becomes wedded to this project. Their mentality is, how do we get this thing approved? How do we make it look good? You're perfectly fine saying this is a bad project, we shouldn't do it. All right, don't try to, don't try to become a champion for your project. That happens in finance classes where people are assigned a company to value it and they become champions for the companies. It's, no, you got to be independent, unbiased. This might be a horrible company. You need to say it's a horrible company. It is, it is. So watch that kind of group bias that happens on group projects where everybody feels like we got to make this thing work. No, if it's horrible, say it's horrible. So watch those biases. So that's the process. You're going to do all of this. Well, you can do implementation if you want to. That's your responsibility. And that won't be part of that. But you do everything through number four. Five and six we won't do. If you like your project, 
and you want to do it, if you want to open a, a franchise, I have, I've never had a team. I had one team talking about them all getting together and actually doing their project and collecting money, but I don't think they actually did it. So I doubt you'll do that. But, you know, you could if you wanted to. Or call up your uncle or aunt, your rich aunt, and say, hey, you should open a Smoothie King. It makes a lot of sense. So you may or may not buy it. But all right. And if you're a management major, you can go in there and manage her four smoothie kings and she'll pay you, you know, 120000 a year. Might be something in for you. Um, a lot of firms, they need some kind of structure to their projects. The USAA did this a little bit differently. What they're trying to do is break them up so that some projects are fast tracked because we don't want to spend a lot of time on them. And other projects take parts more time. Now, USA made a mistake of saying, hey, if it's under $500,000, you can go fast track. And guess what people did? They took a $10 million project and broke it into 20 pieces. So they had 20 projects, each was 500,000. Like, give me a break. Like that marketing software project, they said, well, the first part of your project is the exploration, that's 400,000, so we can fast track that. It's like, no, you got a $40 million project. Um, so it didn't work too well. People started gaming the system. But while some firms say, okay, there are some projects that are just required. We have to do them. Maybe OSHA is telling us we got to put ramps up in the store or whatever. So we'll just do it. It's required. Why are we doing this big cost benefit analysis? Let's just go over to our engineers, find the most efficient way to do it. We'll trust them. Let's not side them with, them with a lot of Excel work. I do know people, though, that actually say, there is a cost benefit here. Let's just ignore the rule. And if we get caught, we'll pay the fines. Uh, have y'all heard of the Ford Pinto case? The Ford Pinto, there's a lot of debate about whether or not this is true or not, but if you go out and read it, because there's been new light shed on it, but uh, there's a great YouTube video of uh, Mil Milton Friedman talking about the Ford Pinto case, which is quite, quite eye-opening. But it's supposedly Ford has this Pinto that it, when it gets rear-ended, it tended to blow up. And so people are getting killed. And supposedly the lawyers at Ford said, it's cheaper just to let people get killed and we'll pay the liability on that than it is to go out and fix all these cars. Supposedly that's the math they did. Now you can listen to Milton Friedman and see the true math behind it because he has a pretty interesting thing to say. Um, but that was a firm that said, you know, if you think it'd be required to fix our cars so the tool tanks don't, tool tanks don't, don't blow up. But, you know, it's cheaper just to pay the claims for the people who do die. Well, that would be a case. Uh, firms do do that and say, forget it. I don't know, in New York City, um, have any of y'all been in New York City where they're checking the, the vaccine cards? Do you think they were really checking the cards or not? <laughs> and if they didn't, what was the risk? I don't know what the fine was, but what was the risk? I know they shut that down here this, this couple last couple of days. But if you own a restaurant, do you think you'd be tempted to say, you know, don't really check it all that closely, just pretend like you are and take the risk? What if the fine is 2,000 bucks? 2,000 bucks, big deal. There's only a 1% chance. I'm not recommending this to y'all, so don't go out and say, I'm saying, you know, violate the law. But you could actually do a cost benefit in that type of environment. The second one is cost savings. Firms love cost saving projects because they're easier to forecast and they tend to be more reliable. So those tend to be more straightforward. I did several of those. I remember one project I have, sometimes you gotta just sit down and figure out how can we do this? So it was our custodial bank. It was $500,000 a year. And my boss said, see if we can find something cheaper. And there were no studies. If I called other banks, they were gonna waste my time. So I said, you know what I'm going to do? No one knows how much custodial banking costs. There's never been any industry studies. There's studies of other banking. So I went out to 10 custodial banks and said, we're doing a survey. We're going to look at custodial bank prices. If you participate in a survey, you get all the results for free. I had 10 banks participate in the survey. Got all these prices. I had them bid on our business. They didn't know how much more or less expensive they were than others. And suddenly they found out they're willing to do it for free. They weren't haggling me because they weren't going to get my business. I said, we're not going to, we're not going to move our business unless there's just a lot cheaper. We came in and our bank was overcharging us $300,000 a year. They immediately cut their prices. 
at least say 300,000 bucks. And you have to be kind of creative and think through it. It's like, how do I find this out? I don't want to go through 10. I don't want to have to go through an entire request for proposal and all that. So you can really add a lot of value to your firm. Most of your firms, I, I say every firm, every firm is wasting money somewhere. That's why they hire you out of college because you see things other people don't see. And so you walk around and say, why in the world are we doing this? You suddenly save the money, save the company money, money. Customer service projects, they're kind of hard to measure. How do you get more sales? How do you do marketing? Marketing projects are pretty interesting. Um, what can you do to get more customers coming in? How much more valuable is a Facebook ad than a Google ad versus a newspaper ad versus a TV ad? Um, Y'all could do a cost benefit analysis of a Super Bowl ad. Is it really worth it or not? It'd be hard to do the numbers, but you know they're probably out there. You could probably Google the net present value of a uh, of a, um, a Super Bowl ad. Um, I don't know how much they cost. Um, expansion projects. These are massive. You're going to spend a lot of time on these. You're not going to do these in a couple of weeks. If you're going to expand overseas, buy another company, start a new product. That's that's a pretty massive thing. You're going to spend a lot of time on that. Same thing with diversification. If you're going to move into new products, move an existing product into new markets. Um, those are major, major, major projects. I have a link to YouTube's, but you don't need this here because I'm going to give these to you as part of Excel. So ignore those. Um, I'll give those to you separately. All right, we've already been through these. Well, I'm going to let you out a little early because of the exam and because of the noise. We'll cover this real quickly after the spring break. Any questions on anything? I know you might be worried about the Excel applications, but don't, most students have very little problem with them. So your only worry right now is the exam and after the exam, your team picking this project, all right? Not that you get mess up your spring break doing that, but pick your project, all right? 